Okay, so the purpose of this video is to discuss the completely randomized design experiment. Um, so I've given an example here, or created an example here. Let's just say that these are drugs that are going to be used as pain medications. So we have pain medicine A, B, and C, and they're going to be designed to help people, let's say, with, with chronic pain. And maybe they're going to report at the end of some time period. Uh, so maybe they take the drug and they let that uh, time period pass, and at the end they report their pain on, say, some a visual scale, which is converted into a number later, a continuous number later. So we have these um, groups. And let's just say, for argument's sake, that um, you know there's an equal number of values in each category. That's really not all that important, but the idea is that um, if there's an equal number of subjects applied to each drug, we would call this a balanced design. It's just a little vocabulary. It doesn't really affect how we're going to analyze the data in this case, but we'll treat it as if all of these have the same number of values in it. So essentially, let's talk about the key idea of a completely randomized design. How do you set up the experiment? Well, what has to be true in the completely randomized design is that you have you have three drugs or three treatments. Um, the number of treatments we refer to as K, as K, K for the number of treatments. Here, K would be three. There are going to be three treatments used in this experiment. And what we're going to do, what's key about a completely randomized design is that the subjects that are applied to each of these must come from independent random samples. So in other words, I would go out and collect a sample of people that are going to get treatment A. And then I'm going to go collect another independent random sample and put those people under treatment B. And then I'll go get another independent random sample and apply those people or subjects to treatment C. So the key idea here is that each of these samples are independent from one another and they're randomly assigned to the treatment that you give them, right? So that makes the completely randomized design experiment set. Now, once you have that, then the question is, you know, what's the purpose of the experiment? Why do we do it? Well, you know, at the bottom here, you can see that essentially, once we have all these pain scores accumulated for each group, we could then average them. We could get a mean for each group. Now, I've put mu a here as if we got the population mean here. That's not correct, of course. It's just a what? Um, we have a sample mean here down here. We have x bar a, x bar b, x bar c. I've written this here just to say that what we're interested in is the mean values for each of these groups. So the true mean values. We don't know what those mean values actually are. So I'll go ahead and replace these now with the symbol that we're more used to, which is essentially what? x bar for a, x bar for b, x bar for c. Okay, so that's fine and well, but what we're really um, interested in in the overall procedure is this. We want to test a hypothesis which says that the mean for treatment A is equal to the mean for treatment B is equal to the mean for treatment C versus the alternative to that idea which is that essentially at least two of these means differ. So at least two differ from one another significantly. So we're saying that you know uh, the pain reduction achieved by drug A, for example, might be less than the other two, or the pain achieved, reduction achieved by drug B is less than the other two, or maybe A and B are less than C, or C is less than A, and so on and so forth, right? Any combination that would make this true, anything that would contradict the null hypothesis. So this is the pair of competing hypotheses we want to test when working with this experimental design. Now, I mean, essentially when we do the problem videos, we're going to explain all the technical details to how that's done, but, you know, so this is just to tell you kind of what makes it a completely randomized design. The first thing I want to point out again is that there are independent random samples that are applied to each treatment. You know, there's no other cross-categorization when you lay out the data, you can see that, right? I mean, this number here belongs to treatment A. It doesn't, you don't have any other way to describe it, right? There's not a list here on the side that says, well, this is um, subject A from, say, the Northeast, right? So that everyone in this row would be from the Northeast and also under this particular set of treatments, right? We don't have that, right? There's just one categorization. If you look at seven, you can describe it only as it's a member of treatment A. That's it. Right? We don't have any other side category to compare it to. We'll see in another kind of experimental design that we often have that second categorization for each subject or point in our set. That's one key sign that it's completely randomized design. But also when you read the problem, you'll have to look for the wording that indicates that, you know, essentially it was just, you know, K treatments, in this case three treatments, and you had independent random samples applied to each treatment. Okay, so 
once you know how to recognize that it's completely randomized design, the next thing, and you know what hypotheses you want to test, the next thing you want to think about, well, is how are they going to make this decision? How are they going to know if the means are all the same versus at least two of them are different? Well, to show you that, I just want to give you, again, without getting into all the technical detail, which will be covered later in the problem videos, I just want to give you the broad idea here by doing a few quick visual drawings. So let's look at two sets of drawings that should clarify. Um, I'm going to use, because we have three means, I'm going to use three markers here. Let's let this marker represent a number line where we record the pain values for group A. And then let's let this marker drop my cat there. Let's let this marker represent the number line for people who are taking drug B. And then finally, this number line here, the last one, will be for people taking drug C. So blue, red, and green colors. All right, so let's imagine a scenario where we have, for example, for the blue uh, group A, we have pain scores that turn out to be like this. Okay, so there's A. And then maybe for B, we have something like, you know, and then maybe for C, we have something like this. All right, so let's talk about um, the idea behind this. We're going to be comparing the means, and of course, to do that, we're going to have to be looking at sample means because we only have samples. Now, the sample mean would probably be about here, right? Um, the balance point between these values. So if that's the sample mean for that group, this is the sample mean for this group, this is the sample mean for this group. If we look at those and we compare them, what you can see is this. The differences between these means here, right? The distance between them on the number line, it isn't that great when compared to the overall variation within this sample, right? There's a lot of variation within the sample. There's quite a lot of variation. In other words, the typical distance you get from the sample mean here and the individual points, that typical distance is pretty big when compared to, let's say, the difference between the individual means. And so what we're saying is essentially, you know, we would have a hard time telling whether this is just normal fluctuation, differences between the means, isn't just due to normal random fluctuation. So in that case, it'd be very hard to reject this HO. Essentially, we'd have to basically say that this evidence is inconclusive, doesn't allow us to reject HO, so we would leave it alone and let it stand. And again, the reason why is because, you know, it's hard to tell if, you know, even though it kind of looks like blue is the higher value, right, so maybe there's more pain when you take drug A, less pain when you take drug C, well, yeah, that kind of looks like how this sample data turned out, but the differences between those means isn't very large when compared to the natural fluctuation we get within uh, within the treatment subjects, you know, uh, samples. So in other words, in this sample of five people, the variation is pretty large when compared to this variation. So what we want to do is try to find a more favorable scenario that would allow us to say that it's pretty visually conclusive. So let's look at this scenario then. Again, we're not using a visual test, but it's just to give you, again, the idea behind uh, the logic of the procedure. All right, so let's look at a, a second case then. What if instead the means turned out to look like this? What if instead we had for C, the five subjects report pain medicines there, the mean being here then, right? Now let's say for B, we end up with that, and the mean is there. And then finally for A, we end up with, and the mean is there. Now when you look at it, you say what? You say, wow, there's quite a lot of distance between these means, right? On the number line, there's a big distance here. That's a pretty big distance when compared to the within subject variation, right? So within this treatment here, these subjects, they have very little variation from their mean, right? They're kind of all clustered in this one little area. So there's very little natural occurring variation there. But the difference between the locations of these groups is quite different, right? So a lot of variation or difference here when compared to the normal differences you see within the data. And again, same here, right? There's a lot of variation there. Not that we would need to see it twice, right? Because all we need to show is that at least two of them differ. But again, you can see that this is big differences between the means, right? Even bigger when you compare those two, at that distance between the location of this mean on the number line, the location of this mean on the number line, when compared to the variation you see within the subjects. 
So essentially, that's the logic of our test. We're going to come up with a test statistic that's going to have an F distribution. And we're going to see how that's done later with the formulas, but let's just say that the logic behind it is pretty simple. We're going to compare the between variation and the within variation. This isn't an arbitrary set of terminology here. The between means the differences between the means. So, you know, where is this mean located versus where is this mean located? That dif those differences compared to the differences that you see within the individual treatments. So the subjects here, what's that variation like? So we're going to compare that variation to this variation, right? And if it turns out that this ends up being much larger than this, we'll have a, a test statistic overall that's larger than one. And if it's significantly larger than one, then we'll conclude that HO is not valid and perhaps we should support HA. Of course, you know we don't use the kind of phraseology of saying uh, not valid, right? But we can conclude that we can reject HO and support HA in that case. We could conclude that perhaps the evidence is strong enough to make that decision. So that's the idea. We'll see how this is done with, um, you know, in the problem set videos. But essentially that gives you the big picture idea of a completely randomized design experiment and how you analyze the data from it.